The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 6241 in the name of Marie Todd on the Garavalt Community Initiative reaches funding target. This debate will be con concluded without any questions being put and, and I would urge members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now and I call on Marie Todd to open the debate. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to lead the debate this evening on community land ownership. Scotland's land is one of our greatest assets and an inclusive and progressive Scotland, in an inclusive and progressive Scotland, it's only right that everyone has the opportunity to benefit from our assets. Scotland has one of the most unusual and concentrated patterns of private land ownership anywhere in Europe. At the last count, just 432 people own half of Scotland's private land. This means that vast amounts of power and wealth are currently held in the hands of a few individuals. I think this needs to be changed. I want to see more of Scotland's land in the hands of more of Scotland's people. The question of who owns Scotland has been an area of contention for many years, and with so much land in so few hands, changes in the law such as the community right to buy were very welcome. There are good reasons for this beyond a drive for social justice. Community ownership of land can regenerate a place economically, socially, culturally, and environmentally. Research by Community Land Scotland shows that communities that buy their own land reap a number of benefits, including the reversal of depopulation, the creation of jobs, and the ability to make money that can be invested back into the community. In addition, people living on community-owned <coughs> land report that they feel more in charge of local decision-making, more connected with the local area, and more empowered. Today, some 560,000 acres of land is in community ownership. And there's a Scottish Government target for that to reach a million acres by 2020. Without legislation, which has given new powers to communities to purchase land for development, we simply would not be where we are today. The SNP established the Scottish Land Fund, which has, put, um, which has 10 million per year available to support community purchases and has a healthy pipeline of interest from communities across Scotland seeking to buy land. Thanks to groundbreaking land reform legislation in Scotland, just under 500 community groups in Scotland now own over half a million acres of land and are able to control their own destiny. In the Highlands and Islands, land reform empowered the Strontian community to buy their local primary school. And on the Isle of Skye, where the tourist industry is booming, projects such as the Fairy Pools car park renovation have received a funding boost from the Scottish Land Fund towards their plans to develop the area and help cater to the very welcome increasing tourist numbers. Land ownership is vital to pro projects like these. The community land ownership movement has its modern origins in the Highlands and Islands, but it has much wider relevance since the Scottish Land Fund has been extended to enable urban communities to buy community assets. I want to focus particularly on the Garvalt Community Initiative, but I hope that others in the debate will highlight the multitude of community buyouts around Scotland. Certainly. Kate Forbes. Just on that point, does the member agree with me that um, rethinking land ownership is directly linked to repopulating the Highlands, as we've seen on the Isle of Egg, one of the first community buyouts which has seen its population go over the 100 mark for the first time in decades? Marie Todd. Absolutely. The Island of Egg has been an inspiration to all the subsequent, um, and I know it's in your constituency, all the subsequent um, community land buyouts of just what can be achieved when you have control of the land. So, as the motion states, Garvalt achieved their funding target for a community buyout of the Sutherland estate land at Port Gower, Gartymore, West Helmsdale and Marrow, as well as a bit of the hill land. The Helmsdale and District Development Trust helped coordinate the buyout process and they secured funding from both the Scottish Land Fund and the Beatrice Partnership Fund. Now, I think it's particularly satisfying that they were able to harness their land asset with money that came from harnessing their renewable energy asset. As I have said before in this chamber, harnessing the renewable energy potential we have in the Highlands Island, uh, Islands will be transformative. Before they received the funding, village residents in East Sutherland overwhelmingly backed the plan to take ownership of the surrounding land. 73% turned out for the election and 96% responded in favour of the buyout. This was obviously a very positive result and provided the evidence of local support which was, which was absolutely crucial for the progress of the buyout. 
the new development officer for the post is the first new job that's been created in the area south of the river for over 60 years. The estate has more than 20 sites of historical interest. Securing the estate's future will allow for the development of business opportunities and create a stream of income into the community. What the new owners are really excited by is the opportunity to invest in the land and to make the area an even better place to live. They want to look at the land management and show it care and attention. Good stewardship is at their core and they want to improve it and pass it on. The most exciting possibility is further job creation, reversing the depopulation and making something of the assets. They are really proud of their Jurassic coastline there and they're keen to show off to the world with sustainable tourism. This buyout just outside of Helmsdale is of particular historical significance given the wider area's history of violent evictions during the Highland Clearances. Helmsdale as a village only came into existence when the people were cleared from the Straths. It is, of course, the site of the emigrant statue commemorating the clearances and the ensuing global Scottish diaspora. The brainchild of gold mining entrepreneur Dennis MacLeod, a direct descendant of those who were cleared, like many of the people who are involved in this initiative, not least his cousin, Anne Fraser, who is the chair. But this really isn't about reversing the Highland clearances. That was different land and a different time. It really is about the opportunities that land ownership brings to a community nowadays. It's refreshing to note the active cooperation of the current Sutherland family in the purchase of this land. The legacy of the clearances still affects this area profoundly and there is a sense of something being put right here. Landowners actively cooperating with communities in the transfer of assets into community ownership is something to be commended and encouraged. Looking forward, while the Helmsdale buyout is relatively small, hopefully this will eventually lead on to a gradual transition of power with the Highlands benefiting from wider, wider repopulation and greater economic gains as a result of land ownership and development. There are many exciting changes happening in the way that land is owned and used in Scotland. And I, for one, look forward to a bright future in which all of our communities, rural and urban, can harness their assets and flourish. Thank you. I call Jamie Halcro johnson to be followed by Ash Denham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I refer members to my register of interest uh, in relation to farming business of J. Halcrow Johnson and Sons. Um, I congratulate Marie Todd on securing this debate and giving the Chamber an opportunity to consider some of the practical elements of community ownership in the Highlands and Islands. Uh, the beauty of the Strath of Kildonan and the wider east coast of Sutherland well known, but in many cases the challenges to build and maintain sustainable communities are often overlooked. Within the 3,000 acres of land that are subject to the buyout, there are markers of deprivation and much to do to exploit the existing resources available to the community. And obviously Marie Todd touched on one of them in terms of renewables. The members of the community initiative expressed their support for development and to attract new residents back to the area. It is positive to have the passion of those local residents as a driver to improve their area. It's also important across Scotland that communities and landowners can work together to ensure the sustainability and improve the land where they live. In this case, the community buyout process has been the result of the collaboration of both parties and to their mutual benefit. In addition to its other schemes of funding, the community initiative notably secured support from the Scottish Land Fund. So I'd like to briefly touch on that. The Scottish Conservative Rural Manifesto published last year made the proposals to open up the land fund to support long lease funding for communities. In some occasions, long leases may be the preferred option for both communities and landowners. And I see no reason why we should, we should not provide parity of support where that is what they seek. I'd also like to pay tribute to those organizations that have progressed the buyout process to where it is today. The Garvalt uh, Community Initiative have been engaging with the Local Development Trust and Highlands and Islands Enterprise in recent years to plan the project and to apply for funding for the venture. I congratulate the project's directors and team, which has clearly been a considerable undertaking. It is important that the buyout is not the end of the support that it's offered to communities like these. In many ways, purchasing the land will be the start of the process rather than the end of one. 
the beginning of the process to develop, to expand, and to make better use of the land. If we wish to see the project as a success and the community as sustainable, we need to continue to, to offer not only our support, but our commitment not to put up unnecessary barriers to that development. The project will likely face, uh, continue to face familiar challenges we see across many rural uh, areas in the Highlands and Islands. The issues will be well known to ministers, quality of transport connections, enduring question of broadband and mobile connectivity, support for farming and other rural businesses. We cannot consider these in isolation, and it's clear that in many ways the support offered to the rural community has fallen short in the past. The challenge that this poses to the Scottish Government is obvious. If we wish to see communities like this thrive, then it must be serious in addressing the wider issues of rural Scotland, and particularly those in the Highlands and Islands. If we continue to see these challenges neglected, then the cost will be considerable, and seen across the country from the tip of Sutherland to the banks of the Solway. So I extend my good wishes to the Garvalt Community Initiative, welcome their commitment to improving the local area in a way that is sustainable and has clearly gained an exceptional level of support within the community. But let us not forget that this is only the first step in a far wider process of building and supporting the communities in our region that can prosper for generations to come. Thank you very much. And I call on Ash Denham to be followed by David Stewart. Ash Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd also like to extend my congratulations to Garvalt Community Initiative for reaching its funding target. Transferring 3,000 acres of land in Sutherland to the community is quite an incredible feat, and I, I look forward very much to hearing all the good progress um, that the community buyout will continue to make into the future. I also want to thank Marie Todd for bringing this topic of community buyouts and the benefits of the Scottish Land Fund to the Chamber this evening. Back in February, when the Garvalt Community Initiative received their grant from the Scottish Land Fund, a community buyout group in my constituency of Edinburgh Eastern, Action Porty, also received a grant. They received £647,000 from the Scottish Land Fund, an award that Action Porty received and that enabled them to purchase the Portobello Old Par Parish Church on Belfield Street. And this actually made history as the first urban right to buy purchase in Scotland. And so it also allows me the opportunity to add an urban perspective to this debate. For those that are unfamiliar with the property, <coughs> it has been a landmark in the Portobello landscape for over 200 years and during this time um, as a working church, it served as a place for the community to come together and, and celebrate. When the church closed, the Action Porty team, through their Save Belfield campaign, organised and made sure that this precious community space would be saved for the future. Portobello is not exactly home at the moment to many spaces where community groups are able to meet, and so this preservation of Belfield and the space that it allows will be a key factor in uh, maintaining the vibrancy of the Portobello area. The project had and continues to have strong buy-in from those in the community in Portobello. A community ballot to initiate the project received 98.7% yes vote approving the community buyout and a recent crowdfunder that just closed, um, I think it was this week or last week, raised £20,000 towards uh, preparing the space for its opening next year. The buyer has been completely successful and uh, the Action Porty received the keys to the property um, just recently on the 6th of September. So it's very exciting. Uh, the strong community support of projects like Belfield and also Garvalt, which received 96% backing in its ballot, as mentioned by um, Marie Todd earlier, really are the essence of why community buyouts such as these and the Scottish Land Fund exist to empower communities to take control of land and spaces that are important to them, to redevelop them in a way that will be sustainable and in the best interests of the people who live there. For Belfield, that will mean a community space for all. Action Porty's vision is to create a fresh and lively space that will be accessible for everyone and for use of those of all ages and abilities, from providing a venue for the arts and entertainment to creating a community garden, an after-school program for children and classes for the elderly. Belfield will build on the legacy of the old parish church and create new and sustained opportunities for the people of Portobello. That sort of space where the people in a community can celebrate creativity, history and their future is much needed in Portobello. 
Across Scotland, there are many other communities that have their own unique needs, which can be realised through the purchase and redevelopment of land in this way. Garvalt and Save Belfield have paved the way for other right to buy initiatives to move forward. I will. Ben McPherson. Thank you. Thank you, Ash Denham, for giving way. Just to, to, to emphasise the point that Ash Denham has, has rightly made, the uh, Action Porte project is an inspiration across the capital city, including inspiring uh, constituents of mine, the Inspire East End project, who are campaigning to save the former London Road Church not too far from here, and also to turn it into a community facility. Ash Denham. I thank the member for that intervention, and I think you're quite right. So I was just going to come on to say that um, Action, um, so Save Belfield, Action Portie, <coughs> and Garval are an inspiration to um, other groups across the whole of Scotland and the future of land ownership and development as well, and a model of what other communities, both large and small, both rural and urban, can accomplish. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call David Stewart to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and could I also could I congratulate as well Marie Todd in securing this evening's debate and also compliment her on, uh, I thought, a very fine uh, speech. Uh, congratulations for that. Apologies to you, President Officer, that I may have to leave early in the debate as of another event, so I apologise not staying for the whole uh, debate. Uh, President Officer, as a Highlander, I've had an interest in the land reform debate since I was old enough to hold up my first copy of the West Highland Free Press. And history, of course, provides a rich tapestry of experiences. Uh, the hiring clearances, the Battle of the Braes, and the Harland Land League. But perhaps lesser known are the seven men of Neudart who defied Nazi sympathizer and landlord, Lord Brockett, to settle the land. Uh, around 550,000 acres of Scotland are now owned and managed by local communities. But significant as that is, it represents only a tiny fraction of Scotland's land. There is, of course, much more scope to push further forward with the agenda of community ownership. Doing that will help to bring the benefit we're seeing in Garbalt and elsewhere to many more communities. Presiding officer, in the book, Who Owns Scotland? John McEwen demonstrated just how few people own the vast bulk of our land. Since it was published in the 1970s, some things have changed for the better, but not enough has. The land ownership pattern remains essentially the same, and that simply cannot be right. As we look forward, we cannot imagine a future Scotland where that continues. And as a presiding officer, a great admirer of David Cameron, no, no, not that one, uh, but the one who was the formal chairman of Community Land Scotland, I remember a speech of his where he called land reform unfinished business that is fundamental to greater social justice in Scotland. And he said, and I quote, is it possible for Scots to conceive of a future Scotland that does not explicitly have greater social justice at its heart? I think not. That is not about fighting battles of the past. Land reforms are a cause of the present and the future. Now, land changes under the feet of people for some odd reasons. In the same speech, David Cameron highlighted an advert for the Gledfield Estate in Sutherland, which appeared in the property section of the Press and Journal some years ago. And I quote, President Officer, the estate will appeal to the international super rich. The asking price for this exceptional property is offers over eight million. But for that, you get a traditional Highland estate with more than 6,000 acres of sporting ground, 2,000 acres of commercial forestry, and a spectacular sporting lodge. Well, President Officer, I can't see many local people having the money immediately to hand that is needed to put in an offer. So I celebrate the Garibald community and the work it's done in achieving its funding target for the buyout through the help of the Scottish Land Fund and as we've heard from the Beatrice Partnership Fund. We need to push on with land reform and build on the work of previous land reform legislation. The community is on the verge of buying out the Southern Estate, marks a new phase in Highland history with the land soon to be reclaimed by the descendants of those who were evicted during the clearances, from the descendants of the man blamed for starting the clearances in the first place. And infamously as, inf infamously as we know, the Duke of Southern began the process of clearing the land 200 years ago, and the communities have been living in the shadow of the decision ever since. 15,000 inhabitants were forcibly removed from the land and their homes. Their homes were then burnt to prevent them moving back in. 
and the physical as well as emotional scars of these actions will remain. But with the community soon repossessing the land, I hope this leads to a new sense of belonging. The land is the community's blood and they can finally come home. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Tom Mason. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you uh, to Marie Todd for giving voice uh, to this very important uh, issue. Uh, members may have noted I've been relatively silent for the last three weeks as I've been suffering from laryngitis. Marie Todd has arranged for me to be temporarily given back my voice uh, to speak in this debate this evening. Let's hope it lasts, for my part, uh, for four minutes. The history, of course, of the area of which we speak is continuing to be writ. On the hill, those of us who've been there will see in the distance the statue of the Duke of Sutherland. There are those who would wish to take down that statue, and there have been many unofficial attempts to do so. Uh, I would leave it there as a constant reminder uh, to the iniquities of the past. But the emigrants memorial that Dennis McLeod uh, was one of the moving spirits behind uh, that now stands adjacent to the A9 at Helmsdale is one of the most moving, poignant and relevant uh, memorials that there is in Scotland. The mother and father walking out of the glen and the child holding, holding mother's hand, looking back, never to see the glen again. It is quite one of the most moving memorials that there is in Scotland. And it speaks to what has happened in an area uh, like that around Helmsdale. Now, for my personal part, we uh, spent more than a decade as a family uh, holidaying at Achmelvik, just north of Loch Inver, on the west coast of Sutherland. And there, of course, we had the blight of ownership by the Vesti family. Not only did they own and control vast swathes of Sutherland and bits of Caithness, and I think into Rothshire as well, but they also paid not a penny in tax to the Exchequer in the UK, retaining their Argentinian domicile as a way of avoiding making proper contribution fiscally, just as they were inhibiting the operation of the community in the area that they owned and controlled. The time for that model of land ownership is past. The Labour Liberal administration that we previously had in this place took the first excellent, widely welcomed steps uh, to ensure that land ownership was placed on a more formal basis and available to people. Previous buyouts, of course, had been much more difficult to achieve. Uh, and we know much of the history of that. I'm delighted that the motion refers to the Countess of Sutherland. I'm delighted that the family uh, has moved to a different attitude uh, to working with the community than that uh, that preceded in centuries uh, before. Uh, this is a very important move for the people in the area of Helmsdale, but it's a very important example of the benefits that can accrue that will start to undo the injustices that came from a pattern of land ownership that did not come because the landowners put out money to buy land. It was seized and used as private fiefdoms. That's no longer the pattern of land ownership that we should accept in the 21st century. And I very much congratulate the people in the area around Helmsdale for the effort they've made in raising the money. And I wish them every success in their future management. The challenge of raising the money was substantial. The long-term challenge of sustaining the area may be even greater. I wish them well. And Tom Mason to be followed by the Minister. Tom Mason. Thank you, President, uh, Deciding Officer. I first of all congratulate Marie Todd for bringing the motion to this debating chamber. The area of Hemsdale is the one I know quite well. As you see from my register of interests, I'm treasurer of the Highlands and Murray Sailing Association, so get into the area quite often. It's not uh, enough, in fact. And many times I've gone up there to see the progress of the Beatrice Field as it's gone 
developing over the years. The Garva Alta Community Initiative is, I think, a shining example of the civic Scotland, people working together to build towards a better future for their local area. And I'm reminded of the community power station in Tilledrone in Aberdeen, which has likewise been funded by the local community. I believe that this project and all in, all in this parliament can and should support this project. I also feel that instead of reflecting on the events of the 19th century for an Englishman in this debate, I have to keep my head down a bit. Our time is better spent discussing the future of this project and the next steps we should take to strengthen the rural communities. This buyout has only been possible because of the work of a dedicated group of volunteers, and I'm delighted to pay tribute to them today for this very hard work and continuous, the job has only just started. I also thank both the Big Lottery Fund and the SSE's Beatrice Partnership Fund, which have provided the capital investment needed to get the project off the ground, and I'm sure many other funding which I haven't managed to identify. We should also recognise the Southern Estate for seeing the tangible benefits for this venture and will bring the lo to the local community and agreeing to sell the land, which is a totally different project than what they came back on. We should be mindful, though, of the difficulties of this area it is currently facing. Defined as a socially deprived and fragile area, which is a great, has a great deal still to be done in creating a thriving local community. But this is a place with huge potential for development and prosperity. 3,000 acres, I believe, of crofting land can be put to good use, driving growth and opportunity for the townships of Marrow, West Hemsdale, Gartimore, and Port Gower. Sustainable economic development is vital. We must be consistent in giving any support necessary to help the area progress further in the future. Unfortunately, presiding officer, this is the, only one example among many where the rural community has not been given the opportunity it, it deserves. R rural areas across Scotland feel left behind as advances in technology and processes move jobs away from the countryside mm -hmm. rather than towards it. We are on these benches on this side, are acutely aware of the problem and will continue working constructively to find solutions. We, we would support moves to promote more balanced land ownership and we encourage both community buyouts like this, this as well as long-term leases in order to support both communities mm -hmm. and landowners. But this should not be treated as a single issue. Between schools, GP access, transport, connectivity, and much more, there is so much, many ways in which our approach to rural areas should be much stronger. We need to empower these communities, and that means extending to them nothing short of public services we would expect and demand in Glasgow, Edinburgh, or even Aberdeen. Presiding officer, this is an exciting time for the local community as they, will, they work to develop their area for the future. We should always seek to recognize this spirit of endeavor and enterprise and people striving to improve the lives of their fellow citizens. It is with this in mind that I welcome the Garthi Alt Community Initiative and I wish them the very best of success in their efforts. Thank you. Thank you, and I call the Cabinet Secretary, Rosanna Cunningham, to conclude the debate. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And my iPad's not going to play in the right way, so I'll turn it round, uh, if you don't mind. Congratulations to Marie Todd for bringing this debate to Parliament, but particularly congratulations to the Garvalt Community Initiative for reaching their funding target. And I'm sure they've listened to the congratulations that have been coming from uh, around the uh, Chamber. And, in particular, can I commend the approach from Sutherland Estates? Once upon a time, that wouldn't be a phrase I could ever imagine to have uttering, but here we are, with the offer to sell 3,000 acres to the local community. It was a welcome offer and an example that I would like to see a great deal more of. I should say at the outset that I can't comment on current live applications. One in particular was mentioned by Ben McPherson, although I know there are many other applications pending that haven't been raised uh, this evening. Land reform is of particular importance to this government, but also to me personally. I spoke at the very first Land Commission conference on Friday, just there. I will say again what I said to them, that I am absolutely passionate about land reform. I was elected to the House of Commons in 1995, and I remember speaking about land reform to a largely bemused chamber Dave Stewart will 
uh, remember that experience because uh, he too will have been through it. The land, however, I, and I, I think a lot of people perhaps outside Scotland don't actually understand this. It is our most basic natural asset and its benefits should be shared by all the people of Scotland. It is fundamental to so many things, including housing, employment and recreation, and of course to agriculture and other industries. But most importantly, it is an integral part of our national identity and prosperity. And Stuart Stevenson reminded us of how emotional an issue it can still be. Scotland has made significant progress in land reform in the 20 years since devolution. We now need to drive forward that sustained progress. And that really can only be done if we work collaboratively. Uh, collaboratively. It's not even a Highlands and Islands phenomena anymore, as Ash Denham so ably spoke to. And I was pleased to visit Belfield Parish Church when they registered their right to buy. They are now the owners. So I hope members will remember that when they're talking about land reform in other venues in the future. Jimmy Halker Johnson talked about partnership. And that is exactly the reason the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement was published on Friday, and I hope you will find the time to go and have a look at that. It's the first of its kind anywhere in the world, and it is about that precisely, that partnership. Um, it is about owners everywhere understanding that they have rights, of course, and that includes the community landowners, but even community landowners have responsibilities, and the responsibilities are to the communities uh, that, uh, uh, that share the land with them. Now, so far this year, funding, this year alone, funding has been approved for over 40 groups, and there's still more to come. As Marie Todd said, over 200 groups have been referred to the Land Fund for Assistance, and our partners in HIE and the Big Lottery are actively supporting those groups in this pipeline through the process. Of those 200 groups, around half are from out with the Highlands and Islands area, and I hope that reinforces the point I was making earlier. That shows there is a drive and enthusiasm for community ownership across Scotland, and we have stepped up to the plate with financial assistance to help communities achieve those aspirations. But the aspiration is ownership, and so it should be. The land fund is particularly important, is often a key factor in the purchase, but funding does come from other sources too. For example, HIE, the Renewable Energy Fund, such as the Beatrice Partnership Fund, Big Lottery, um, which are often critical to getting these projects off the ground. So I'm delighted that the increased budget of £10 million that we've allocated to the land fund is being used by projects like this one, and that it is available to help local communities across the country. It has also been adapted to mirror the legislative changes brought in through the Community Empowerment and Land Reform Acts in recent years. So community groups are now able to access funding through stage one applications to the fund to help put together business plans, feasibility studies and other work which will help groups better prepare themselves to take on land and buildings. And that is precisely the kind of capacity building that I hope Jamie Halker Johnson would welcome uh, as being a fundamental uh, important part of communities being successful uh, in their buyout. In fact, the project that we are congratulating in this chamber today benefited from £23,000 in the first place to do just that, and the results are plain for all to see. So all of this work together will help to ensure that Scotland's land reform journey is heading in the right direction and that it continues well into the future. With support from the Scottish Government and others, local communities can be part of this journey helping to drive it forward rather than being merely passengers. The range of projects that communities are capable of is staggering at times, from crofting estates like Garvalt in the north to community woodland in Moffat, from a former school in Carloway in the Western Isles to a gospel hall and gardens in Aberdeen. Communities across Scotland, both urban and rural, are taking the initiative. Now, as members will know, the latest programme for government contains a number of commitments on land reform, including asking the Land Commission to explore a number of options for further radical land reform and to provide guidance and codes of practice to drive change on the ground. Just like the Commission, we want to drive increased economic, social and cultural value from our land. We want to encourage a more diverse pattern of land ownership, with the benefits of land spread much more inclusively. And we want to ensure that decision-making 
takes account of those affected and that all owners of land accept that ownership brings responsibilities. Examples like the ones I've mentioned show that there's a desire out there for community ownership. There's a determination amongst communities across Scotland to take more control over their own futures. And this government is determined to support those communities in any way it can, ensuring that ownership of assets leads to a brighter, more sustainable future for local communities. Community groups like Garvalt can be used as an example to others to show just what benefits can be realised with ownership of assets, and I do congratulate them wholeheartedly for doing so. That concludes our debate. I thank all members for their contributions, and I now close this meeting.